hi, how are you? And welcome to another podcast by George. Come on in. It's the Hot Stove League. You know, that's what they call the guys that sit around and talk about baseball during the winter months. And we're going to talk politics in this Hot Stove League. And we've got the the winter for it, that's for sure. It's been a very hard winter here and across much of the country. And these presidential candidates are making their way across the great state of Iowa in preparation uh, for the Iowa caucuses, of course. And I'm going to talk to some of them. And you're going to get a different twist. You're going to get a Midwestern angle. You're going to get a no baloney perspective on these presidential candidates. I know a lot of people would say, well, what do you want to put that on your podcast for? I can get that at a lot of places. I can get that on... Uh, you know, the networks, MSNBC, C-SPAN, I can get the Republican guys on Fox. Well, the the point of it is, is that if you're getting your information that way, you might be getting it in just little snippets. It's highly curated. And um, or like on C-SPAN, I, you can go there and you can get a, a, a two hours of unedited, you know, make a life out of this stuff. But in these podcasts, I'm going to try to do it in, you know, 20, 25 minutes or so and give you some insight that you might not be able to get elsewhere. And the insight today has to do with John Hickenlooper. This is a candidate you may not know much about. And I'm going to read as an intro here an article in the uh, New York Times written by Julie Turkowitz, which I think is an excellent summation on uh, Mr. Hickenlooper. He's the two-time Colorado governor and former brew pub owner who has overseen Colorado's remarkable economic expansion, He declared his candidacy for president on Monday, and uh, that Friday, he was here in Iowa and at a brew pub. He was at the Confluence uh, Brewery at Mr. Hickenlooper, 67, a socially progressive, pro-business Democrat, has called himself an an extreme moderate. Long said he was considering a run and made early visits to Iowa and New Hampshire. His biggest challenge will be distinguishing himself in what is sure to be a packed field of potentially history-making candidates and deep-pocketed household names. In his announcement on Good Morning America, he said the nation had entered a crisis of division. Man, if that ain't true. I think it's probably the worst period of division we've had in this country since the Civil War, he said. Ultimately, I'm running for president because I, uh, because I believe that not only can I beat Donald Trump, but that I am the person that can bring people together on the other side and actually get stuff done. The division is keeping us from addressing big issues like climate change and the soaring costs of health care. Mr. Hickenlooper said he planned to run as a pragmatic progressive. Now, I like that because I'm all about pragmatism. It's great to talk about dreams. It's great to talk about philosophies. But, I mean, something's got to happen. It's got to be real. It's got to be tangible. And I've got some criticism for some of the candidates, uh, most notably... Bernie Sanders, who uh, I just came from one of his rallies today. I'm going to have him on a podcast here very shortly, and we'll talk about that a little bit more. I mean, uh, sometimes the pragmatism, I think, is lacking, and Hickenlooper calls himself a pragmatic progressive. He's a candidate with extensive executive experience in a primary field of senators. He's also suggested that his childhood as a self-declared nerd had prepared him for an electoral battle against the president. As a skinny kid with Coke bottled glasses and a funny last name, he said in a campaign video released Monday with the Rocky Mountains as his backdrop, I've stood up to my share of bullies. The next few weeks are going to bring several other moderates into the race, including Senator Sherrod Brown of Ohio. Maybe, although we've got an expert on the show that says he's not going to run at the top of the ticket. Governor Steve Bullock of Montana and former Vice President Joseph R. Biden Jr. Even Mr. Hickenlooper's own former chief of staff, Senator Michael Bennett of Colorado, is thinking of entering the race. And if you haven't checked out my podcast uh, with Dr. Stephen W. Schmidt, you need to do that because we talk about exactly this issue. And uh, it's interesting that it's highlighted in this article. I was governor from 2011 until he reached his term limits in 2019. Mr. Hickenlooper employed a careful consensus-building approach that won him praise from both sides of the aisle and helped him guide Colorado out of a recession and through a series of floods, wildfires, and mass shootings in the first years of his tenure. When he left office in January, his state had one of the nation's best economies, I also signed a contentious gun control package that included universal background checks and helped Colorado become the first state in the nation to enact 
methane capture requirements, a measure, he said, was equivalent to taking 320,000 cars off the road every year. So even in Colorado, though, some fellow Democrats have expressed skepticism that his signature low-key approach will translate to national success. Uh, quoting, I don't think John has all defined why he's running, said Rick Ritter, a political strategist and longtime friend of Mr. Hickenlooper. There are very few people I know who wake up and want to go to caucus to support a raging moderate. <laughs> I, I, I like that, a raging moderate. Okay, so the former governor kicked off his campaign with a rally in Denver, and he was here in Iowa on Friday and Saturday of the uh, same week. Hickenlooper moved to Colorado back in 1981 to work as a geologist in the oil industry. And after a layoff, he opened the downtown Denver Brew Pub, eventually expanding to 15 pubs and restaurants, mostly in the Midwest. Soon he was helping to reshape Denver's dilapidated core. By 2003, he was mayor in 2007. He won re-election with 87% of the vote. During his tenure, Denver expanded pre-K to every four-year-old in the city. He ran for governor and won in 2011. In that position, Mr. Hickenlooper pushed through Medicaid expansion under a divided legislature and signed the gun control package, a major shift for the state. Colorado also gained national attention when Mr. Hickenlooper helped the state establish a national model for recreational marijuana regulation, despite his personal opposition to legalization. But progressives in the state reserve much of their criticism for his environmental legacy, arguing that he has not gone far enough in regulating the state's oil and gas industry. In recent years, some residents have faulted him for failing to push well projects out of their neighborhoods. Uh, Mr. Hickenlooper, maybe you heard about this. The article goes on to say that he's been so eager to promote the industry that he once drank fracking fluid. Did you know that? He drank fracking fluid. Now, this came up at his uh, speech here in Des Moines, and uh, it's an interesting thing. And I wanted to start off with his comments because... It's not every day you're going to meet somebody that's uh, been drinking fracking fluid, but he's done it. Here's uh, former Governor John Hickenlooper. Just so we're clear about fracking fluid, so fracking doesn't cause earthquakes. What causes earthquakes is you take the produced fluids coming out of oil and gas wells and you re-inject them to dispose of them. They're full of salt. They're saline. And that injection causes earthquakes, right, on some occasions. We don't have that problem in Colorado, but they do in Oklahoma. Uh, in some other places. The issue isn't the fracking, right? Everyone gets so wound up in the fracking, the, fr the issue is hydrocarbons, right? And the, and the question we should all be asking is how fast can we get to a fully green energy solution? The reason, the reason I drank frack fluid and the, the people that opposed me are gonna, they're gonna follow me for the rest of my life. <laughs> I was sitting there with the, a couple of the oil and gas executives trying to build some trust. And they said, well, at that time, they would not reveal the ingredients in frack fluid. I said, well, you've got to. It's like you've got a, a, a social contract with the citizens of our state. And they said, well, we've been working on this. This is a prototype. We're not using it yet. But this frack fluid, it looked kind of like it was clear, totally transparent, but the viscosity, like, you know, not quite honey, like molasses. They said, this is made with all components that were approved by the, 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 the FDA, the Food and Drug Administration. So they're perfectly safe. I said, yeah, right, I'm not drinking that. They go, no, it's safe. He takes a swig. But this is the CEO of a large. So what, what do I do? I, I, I needed to build a relationship. I figured if he was going to drink it, I wasn't going to die. So, so I took a swig of it, right? And just fast forward a year, we had, or a year and a half, we had our, our methane regulations done. They revealed everything in the frack fluid. You know, the issue, we, we end up dividing ourselves on this stuff, and, and, and fracking is a classic example. The issue is hydrocarbons, right? Hydrocarbons are what are creating climate change. It's not fracking. Fracking allows us to get hydrocarbons. If we ban fracking, then, then we wouldn't be able to get hydrocarbons, but someone else would be getting it. What we have to do right now in Iowa, and you guys are one of the great wind capitals of the world, just for the record. <laughs> but we have to go and, and, and prove to the world that we can have a clean energy economy that, that is less expensive. It is, it's 
going to be less expensive when that when we get that word out and prove that be, what we did in Colorado can be replicated across the country, then things are going to change like that. Well, one of the better questions from the crowd at the uh, little rally, like, you know, I say little rally, but it really wasn't. That's the other thing. The, uh, people are really turning out for these things. And it shows you probably the energy in, in the Democratic Party. It also shows you the divisiveness of the electorate. Everybody's mad as hell. And the other thing is, I think a lot of people just love the echo. They go to these events because they're sick to death of uh, hearing Donald Trump every which way uh, on every form of media that there is. And they go to these uh, events, and there ain't no Trump. It's uh, all pro-Democrat and, uh, in some instances, uh, pro-progressive. But one of the better questions at the event uh, actually came at the end, and it had to do with this pragmatism. The, the question was, how are you going to do it, John? How are you going to bring people together? How are you going to get anything accomplished? If you're a compromiser in this environment, how do you get a compromise? And this is what he said. The bottom line is, so everything in Washington starts with Congress. And, and this sounds crazy, and I've been criticized for this, but the first thing I do is I go see Mitch McConnell. And I understand he's the enemy. I understand everybody hates him. I understand he probably wouldn't do anything. I get it. I hear that. But you, you've got to go and make that chance. And I go back again and again. You, you know, you hear the stories of, of how Ronald Reagan became friends with Tip O'Neill. They hated each other, right? In the beginning, they hated each other. But, but they would go back, and one or the other would need something from them, and they would just make that time. Life is about relationships, right? And so that's Congress. The, the real bottom line is we don't necessarily need Congress to do two-thirds of what I've talked about right now. I mean, the, the actual changing laws is, is less important than how we reallocate our resources. So how do we get more money into, uh, into community colleges, right? That's a, a, almost all a local issue and yet can be done in such a way that you provide the federal government can provide a tax incentive or you know a tax rebate for businesses that help fund community colleges. It would take a sliver to do that. I mean, almost nothing. Uh, you go back and look at uh, how are we going to look at the issues around healthcare and healthcare. I mean, the bottom line is we are right now have a system where we're rewarding bad health. Right? It's become a business. Right? When it used to be, when I was a kid, your hospitals were almost all nonprofits, and now it's a business. So they, let's say a, a hospital sees someone might become, become, might be becoming a, di a, a diabetic. If they prevent that person from becoming a diabetic, they get no reward. Right? The only thing that, that matters is, is how do you, uh, if, if the hospital, if that person becomes a diabetic and has a health crisis, all of a sudden they get showered with money. And our incentives are completely backwards. And that is, I mean, that will take getting everybody, the, in, in terms of healthcare, everybody at the table and recognize that everybody's gonna have to give. Right? It's gotta be the pharmaceutical companies, it's gotta be the, the hospitals, it's gotta be the doctors, it's gotta be the insurance companies. Uh, and the, this notion that we can blame one group worse than another, they're all trying to make money, right? And they're all, you know, trying to switch the system in their benefit. I'll tell you one thing that should alarm everybody. There's a friend of mine that is a, a speaks at, at, at uh, uh, conventions, right, associations. And he told me this, I couldn't believe it, but it's true. There are 81,000 trade associations, right? So the, the, the sand and gravel producers, the, the, uh, the, the conduit manufacturing association, you go down 81,000, Almost all of them have a lobbyist, right? And what's that lobbyist job to do? Is to find them a tax break, right? Find them some way that all their members can get a reward for being a member of that association. You think about it, 81,000 people all just <coughs> hanging around Washington. No wonder Washington's booming now, right? Yeah. And I think at some point, if you're, gonna, if you're gonna get everyone to work together, you've gotta begin to diminish that, that profit motive with all the law. Now, Hickenlooper, one of his uh, criticisms, and uh, not a criticism, but one of his traits or characteristics, and you probably maybe picked it out a little bit there. He's an entertaining speaker, don't get me wrong, but he has a tendency to meander a little bit. He has a tendency to go off topic. He does like to tell a joke or two. Um, 
interesting. He gets to the point sometimes, but in kind of a roundabout way, and that's kind of the way it was at Confluence Brewery in Des Moines during this rally that Podcast by George was at, and your intrepid reporter uh, collared him after the uh, presentation. Actually, he's quite uh, approachable and easy to talk to. But I asked him uh, about the fact that Iowa, one of our primary issues, is clean water. We've got a problem in this state. We've got a lot of hog lots. We've got a lot of crap in the water, literally. And so Colorado, as you know, is known for its pure, clean water. And if you watch television at all, you know that because of all of the advertisements from those friends uh, at the beer company started by Mr. Adolph and Adolph Coors, of course. So I wanted to know uh, how they deal with clean water in Colorado and what can he do as president to try to bring clean water to the state of Iowa and elsewhere where it's a big issue? How can he do that as president? I've got a podcast called Podcast by George. Huh. Yeah, and lifelong Iowa Democrat. Here in Iowa, we've got an issue with clean water. When we think of Colorado, we think of clear water because of you know the great beer well, that you guys have got out there. We've got problems oh. too. What can you do to address that issue on a federal level as president? Well, I don't think it's a... What the federal government, in my opinion, uh, on clean water, is to provide testing and transparency. I think if you go, from what I've seen, I, I've seen a couple maps of where, where the most problems are. A lot of it's agricultural. Yes. But every farmer I know, if you show them that their actions are actually hurting the, the streams, they're the ones who love to fish and love to be outdoors. What's happening is they're, they hear general problems. They don't really think it's, it's their problem. And I think these days you can test water quality so inexpensively. I bet in the next three or four years we're going to have it so that a cell phone can do pretty accurate you know, test of, of water quality. Once we start testing water everywhere and then map it so all the other farmers see what you're, you know, when you get, when you get a heavy rain in the spring and, and see where the little spikes are for you oh, know, no. phosphate and nitrogen and Nitrates, those things like that. No. I, you know, people in rural areas, people in America hate the, the federal government to come down and clamp on them. So the most successful solutions we're going to have are providing the tools and the motivation for local people to solve it themselves. You know, polluting your streams and rivers shouldn't be that hard to fix. Now, is that kind of voluntary compliance work? Not voluntary compliance. I think, I think, I think we, we set standards. If people don't uh, uh, get to those standards, then we, you know, we take harsh, hard, uh, stronger action. But we do spend a couple of years negotiating, trying to do everything we can, like for, for local municipalities where the new higher EPA standards, they, they're not in compliance and they, they can't afford to put in a whole new water treatment system. Do we give them an extra three years or four years? Or do we come up as a state, we come up with some extra money to help? Yeah, of course we do, because we're all in together, right? And that's, I think that's where the, the federal government being the boogeyman to come in and say, we're gonna pound your knuckles, Right? That's not a very effective way to, to solve our problems at scale. Yeah, we are in it together. Thank you. So that's former Colorado Governor John Hickenlooper, and uh, he was talking at a brew pub, and he had a beer in his hand and was taking a sip or two while he was talking to me. you got to love that. i got to love a guy that uh, will take a drink and is, uh, looks like a normal, regular human being, <laughs> which he does. I guess that's in his favor. And uh, he's out there running. He's just getting it going. We'll keep tabs on him when he reappears someplace here in the state of Iowa prior to these Iowa caucuses. Maybe we'll get out there and talk to him again. But for now, that's Governor John Hickenlooper, uh, one of the newest candidates for U.S. president. And before I leave, I again want to encourage everybody to listen to podcasts by George. Follow us on Facebook. You can get us on Twitter. We're at www.podcastbygeorge.com. We're on iTunes. We're on Spotify, we're on YouTube, we're everywhere you are. So find us and follow along. This is going to be fun, and it's not going to be your normal, boring, and certainly not uh, unfairly biased, I don't think, presentation in the run-up to the 2020 presidential election. But for now, that's another podcast by George.